I thought I was going to have a major role in the Justice League movie. You do have a major role in the Justice League movie. You allow us to be able to meet our affirmative action quota by remaining in the background. Just be glad you ain't on a Berlanti production. Coming to paperback and e-readers in 2021, John Haynes taking care of business. The man who rules the world breaks in a brand new partner to help him take care of business in this action-packed all-new John Haynes series adventure. Get John Haynes taking care of business in 2021 at online booksellers everywhere. Recently, actor Ray Fisher, the actor who played Cyborg in the Justice League movie, stated that he will not participate in any production associated with current DC Films president, Walter Hamada. And as a result of this statement, the character of Cyborg was written out of the Flash movie, and Warner Brothers has stated that the role will not be recast. Now, this is the latest salvo in the ongoing issues that actor Ray Fisher has had with Warner Brothers after he publicly accused Justice League director Joss Whedon of gross, abusive, and unprofessional behavior on the set. Now, your Ray Fisher also alleges that your Joss Whedon's gross, abusive, and unprofessional behavior on the set was enabled by then DC Entertainment President Jeff Johns and by John Berg, a former co-president of production at Warner. And these conditions were so bad, as alleged by Ray Fisher, that he el took escalated things up to Warner Brothers executives in management. And as a result, your John Berg left the company as part of a so-called restructuring in 2017, while Jeff Johns stepped down seven months later. Now, after this, your Ray Fisher then began to criticize your Hamada. And when I take a critical examination of Ray Fisher's claims, they have the ring of truth of them to me. Because when I take a critical examination of Ray Fisher's claims of gross, abusive, and unprofessional behavior on the set, they fit right in line with the pattern and profile of behavior I have seen as related to the way black actors are treated on the sets of shows like NBC's Heroes, as Leonard Roberts recently claimed in a recent article, and to allegations that were made by McCod Brooks on the show Supergirl. So I look at the behaviors that Ray Fisher is talking about, and again, they seem to fit within this pattern stated by other actors, in, such as Leonard Roberts and McCod Brooks, and also actors like John Boyega, who recently made claims about being marginalized and mistreated on the set of the Star Wars sequel trilogy. And what's really troubling about all of these claims made by these black actors is how they are being received by the comic book sci-fi and fantasy communities. Now, your Ray Fisher is being called a cryborg by many comic fans and by people like your Ethan Van Skyver, and he's also being called a whiner. But I don't really see Ray Fisher as being a whiner. He has legitimate claims that have been substantiated by management at Warner Brothers, and he clearly sees how this, this role is not really something that is presenting him in a positive image. But when I look at Hollywood overall and how it presents black men, especially heterosexual black men in these superhero movies, they oftentimes try to find a way to marginalize those black male characters. And I guess that's one of the things that Ray Fisher had an issue with as related to his portrayal of Cyborg in Justice League, where he probably was a, his role was probably getting more and more marginalized with each um, day of shooting and day of editing. And he was probably thinking that he came here to play a meaty role, not understanding that what Hollywood usually tries to do with these roles featuring black actors is 
present them in a tokenized fashion. The whole idea that Hollywood usually has for these superhero movies is to elevate the white characters and usually just have the black characters in the background. That's what happened on Star Wars with Finn. Many people thought that John Boyega was going to be the lead character in that movie, but his role was practically marginalized and he was practically made into a bumbling, stumbling fool on screen. And that's, again, par for the course, because when we look at what happened to Leonard Roberts on Heroes, he was also thinking that he was going to be taking this role and it was going to take him to the next level. But in actuality, the people in production just were setting him up to be play another black brute in the background. And then they cut his role down after they realized that they were go that it was probably going to tank the show if he got was shown on screen with this white woman in a in, in the second episode. So they wound up pushing Leonard Roberts all the way back to the sixth episode, and then they wound up killing his character off because they know if they put him to the foreground, that would wind up costing killing the entire show. And it's also similar to what happened to McCard Brooks on Supergirl, where he was set up to be the love interest of Kara, but then once these comic book fans started to get seer about this interracial relationship, we started to see how racist many of them were. And after they heard about McCard Brooks's James Olsen being involved with Supergirl, these guys wound up losing it, and then McCard Brooks's role was practically cut down in the first season, and then he was emasculated, made into the guardian of the friend zone, and then eventually was minimized to the point where he practically just wound up leaving the show. So there's a pattern here as related to the way these black actors are treated on these shows, and I believe that this pattern is a part of a culture of racism that goes on the set of these superhero shows. But many in the comic book, sci-fi, and fantasy communities, they will try to dismiss these claims that are made by actors like Ray Fisher and John Boyega, but there, as I see it, is legitimacy to their claims, and there's also, it just shows you how deep the culture of racism goes on in these comic book, sci-fi, and fantasy communities that they would sit there and call your Ray Fisher a cryborg, and they would say that he has a sense of entitlement because they are upset that their fan favorite, peop fan favorite people, like Joss Whedon, who is known in the comic book community to be a sort of icon for creating the show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the show Angel, and Jeff Johns, who is known for his storied role run on Justice Society of America and The Flash. Many people herald these two guys, and they can't think that these guys would be capable of participating in behavior like racism or being verbally and physically abusive on the set of a production or enabling this kind of behavior. But I, I, when I look at this whole incident, it, it shows me that the, a lot of people really do not understand the overall culture of Hollywood or how racist it truly is. And they really don't, and because they're putting these people on a pedestal, they can't see that they could be possibly capable of doing these things. Because, I mean, when I ask a critical question, I mean, how many black men are working at DC Comics? That's a, that's a question that people really need to ask. And how many black men are, ever work with Joss Whedon on one of his shows? Those are questions that many people in the comic book world don't want to ask because they know if they answer that question, you're going you're gonna to probably hear a low number or no number at all. And when you have an environment like that, you don't really, you, it creates a culture of racism that most people don't want to acknowledge. Moreover, it, that culture is also, you know, enabled by a whole group of comic book 
black comic book people and black nerds who go out here and bootlick for people like Joss Whedon and Jeff Johns and Walter Hamada. Their bootlicking enables that hostile environment to continue to go on. So you'll have this culture going on and most people, they think they can go along to get along like John Boyega did on the set of Star Wars and people like your Leonard Roberts thought he could do on Heroes. And what that does is enable the culture to go on and it doesn't stop the racism from continuing to go on behind the scenes because it's that silence that enables these people to think that they can continue going on mistreating black people on the sets of these shows and these movies and it enables them to think that they're perfectly in the right. And I, again, when I take a critical examination of Ray Fisher's claims, they, again, fit right in line with that pattern of behavior I have seen and read about on the set. I haven't really seen, but I've read about on the sets of shows like Heroes, shows like Supergirl, and other show, other shows like these Berlanti shows like Arrow, where we clearly see a passive-aggressive culture in that show Arrow, where we see your John Diggle, who is the playing the role of the butler. We see Mr. Terrific, a heterosexual black man in the comics, turned into a gay, bumbling, stumbling idiot. And we start to see in the show Riverdale, we saw Chuck Clayton turned into a black brute. And I wonder if I went to the sets of shows like Arrow and talked to the actors who played John Diggle and Mr. Terrific, would their stories fit right in line with the pattern that was discussed on in Ray Fisher's claims? Because it's, again, clear to me that there's a culture of this going on and your Ray Fisher is being called a cryboard and entitled when, as I see it, he has a legitimate claim. And this legitimate claim needs to be taken seriously because it is highlighting a major issue on the sets of these shows and how black actors are being treated on these shows. So I look at this whole thing and I can see a culture of racism on the sets of these shows, a culture of racism in the way these black characters are portrayed in these shows, and too many comic fans, sci-fi fans, and fantasy fans are too spellbound to by their um if their whole idea their their fantasies about writers like Jeff Johns and people like Walter Hamada and people like Joss Whedon to see that maybe it's possible that these people aren't what you fantasize them to be. Maybe in reality, these people are capable of racism and maybe they don't really stand for the same ideals that they present in their stories. No, many comic fans, they just want to sit down and make Ray Fisher the bad guy. But I look at his story and again, he has a lot more to lose to make these claims because he's at the bottom of the Hollywood totem pole. This role was just his start as an actor, and he has a lot to lose from making these claims because similar to what I saw with Af Af black actress Afton Williamson on the show The Rookie, she also had a lot to lose by making claims of sexual harassment against people on the set of her show. And she was so hurt by what happened to her on the set of that show that she was willing to quit at working on the set of that show. And that, to me, right there, was a legit showed me a legitimacy of the claim because if you're on a production and when it comes down to actors, you don't really make that much money with when, when you're starting out and you get a regular role on a show, you're going to try to do anything to keep that job. And you and, and, and when an environment gets that hostile, it means that that environment actually was that hostile. I mean, 
And nobody's going to walk away from a payday in Hollywood unless there's something really going on here, especially if they are a D-list actor. I mean, Ray Fisher was not A-list at all. I mean, he was a D-list actor. And if he's willing to walk away from that production, it doesn't mean that he was a prima donna. No, it means that there were legitimate issues as related to that production because a, when you have a D-list actor walking away from, from the set of a big budget movie that was probably paying him anywhere from three to five million dollars if he had a good agent, it tells me that there was serious problems on the set and he was really having serious issues on the set. But many comic fans out here, especially the racist comic fans, they look at the, co at the color of Ray Fisher's skin and not look at the content of his arguments. And because these people are so wedded to their imagined ideas about writers like Jeff Johns and Joss Whedon because they made their favorite TV shows and their favorite comics, they can't really see that maybe it's possible that these guys are the bad guys and maybe they enabled a culture of racism on the set of these shows and they maybe they did mistreat Ray Fisher because when I look at it, it I can clearly see, again see based on the merits of the argument as related to the case. This could possibly be true because again, you, when you have a D-list actor, he has everything to lose and nothing to really gain. And when I look at, the, at this whole Ray Fisher thing, again, it shows me how there's a really big divide in the comic book world between black and white. And a lot of times when I look at that divide, it's oftentimes covered up by this group of black bootlegs who are out here, this group of black people, these black nerds and stuff who want to not say anything about the racism that goes on in the comic book community, the sci-fi community, and the fantasy community. They want to remain silent because they are looking for white acceptance and they're not understanding that when you do this, you allow this culture of racism to go on. Now, another thing I noticed about this case was, you know, I think one of the reasons why they had a real fish issue with Ray Fisher is because he was a black American. And as a black American, they really didn't want him there because black Americans are going to call out racism when they see it because we can identify it faster than a foreign black like John Boyega. So I think a lot of issues he had was because they didn't really want him there because if you have a black man on set, you can't really do things like what they do on some of these productions, like what they did with Finn and making him a bumbling, stumbling character and then get a pass for it or marginalize him like Firestorm was in Legends of Tomorrow. You can't really get away with that stuff when you have a black actor who's self-aware. And I also look at this whole thing with Ray Fisher and I can just see how this guy has been really done dirty by everybody in the comic book world because to sit there and call him cryboard and say that he's whining i can't say that he's whining because there's if he's making these allegations and management is wanting to do something about it there has to be some legitimacy to his claims but it also shows me how your comic book world is filled with some with with racists and nobody's really tackling that racism and really dealing with it. Because, I mean, this guy, was, as I see it, was mistreated on the set. And he had legitimate claims. And again, nobody's going to walk away from that kind of payday in, the, in, in acting when, unless the conditions on the set were untenable. So I look at Ray Fisher's claims and they have that legitimacy. And I look at the way that um he was treated and again it's fitting into a pattern and a profile as related to these comic book and superhero productions and when i look at the ultimate thing that black people need to do is we have to look at this and see that maybe we're not wanted now i heard mr superboy talk about 
this in a video he talked about maybe it's time to boycott them and I have to agree with him on that because if these people don't want the dollars of black if they don't want to treat black comic actors act I know let me, let me get that right if they don't want to treat black actors on the set of these movies right then maybe they should not get black dollars because if it wasn't for black dollars the um whole thing they wouldn't these movies wouldn't be as big as they are and if it wasn't for black productions we wouldn't have a superhero movie genre the superhero movie genre was revived by Wesley Snipes and his A-list star power with Blade and the superhero franchise got its highest grossing movie with Black Panther so I find it really sad that all of these racist white comic fans want to attack Ray Fisher when it was black productions that enabled these productions to still be going on. Because again, if it wasn't for on your mind. All right. Wesley Snipes with Blade, we would not have a superhero genre to continue to go on. We would not have Spider-Man movies in 2002, X-Men movies in 2000. We would not have the MCU or even the DC um, extended universe. None of that would have been possible if it wasn't for Wesley Snipes and Blade. And we wouldn't have had the highest grossing superhero movie of all time with unless there was a Black Panther. So I find it really, a lot of these people sitting there going and trying to attack again Ray Fisher not understanding the power of the black dollar because if you keep disrespecting black people they're gonna sit there and say you know we have these dollars we're putting them into these movies but these people are not giving us respect and that's something that many black comic fans sci-fi fans and fantasy fans really need to think about because you're putting money into these productions and we're watching as we get marginalized in movies like Black Panther where T'Challa is a background character in his own movie. We're watching Cyborg marginalized in Justice League even though he doesn't really belong there. He's a teen titan. And we're also watching Ray Fisher being mistreated and we also see people like your Mr. Terrific being made into a bumbling stumbling idiot. We're seeing John Diggle being made into a butler getting an n-word moment on Arrow when he acts to put on the Green Arrow suit and is told by Oliver Queen that being Green Arrow makes me the best me I can be. I mean, these are middle fingers thrown up at black comic fans, sci-fi fans, and fantasy fans. And it's showing that they really do not value the black dollar that is spent on these products. So when I look at the way Ray Fisher was mistreated and the way we have this culture in the comic book sci-fi and fantasy world of having these racist fanboys and these people mistreating black people, then, as like Mr. Superboy said in his video, we really need to reevaluate how we spend our dollars. And as I see it, we really need to start thinking about spending our own dollars with black people and start putting more and more of our money into black comics, black science fiction, and black fantasy because if these people in the comic book and sci-fi and fantasy worlds don't appreciate the black dollar then maybe we need to start spending our money with black creators like myself who would appreciate those black dollars because I appreciate every black dollar I get from black people who pick up my books like the Isis series the e Steam series the John Haynes series and even the books of the Spinsterella trilogy I appreciate and value every dollar I get from black fans out here. And as I see it, black people deserve better than the mistreatment they have received as related to these kind of productions where they either, again, present us in marginalized roles, token roles, or they give us reskinned characters. We deserve better. And when I look at Ray Fisher trying to get better, on the set of, the, of these kind of shows, I, I just see it, again, as a waste in futility. And it's time for us to start working on building our own and building our own productions. Now, if I had 20 million or 30 million, I would offer Ray Fisher the role of John Haynes. And I would 
offer it to him because I know that he could do better playing John Haynes and being a lead character than being a background character in a movie like Justice League. And he would probably fare better in a John Haynes production where he would get full character development and a full story than be a token in a Justice League movie where they have him say one or two lines and he's just in the background and the white characters are in the foreground as the heroes and he's just the guy who's, who's basically the doorman or the butler. I mean, as I see it, we need to start making our own and supporting our own. If they don't want us in their fantasy world, we can create our own fantasies and we can take our own money and our own resources and make those fantasies into real productions that put real dollars into the black community. That's what we can do as related to going out here and dealing with all of these people who, want, who don't want us in their Star Wars, who don't want us in their DC Universe, who don't want us in their Marvel Universe. We don't really need to do that anymore. And when I look at productions out here, like Tuskegee Airs, stuff like Black Sands, stuff like Concrete Comics, we are creating our own fantasy, and we really need to start putting our black dollars into our own fantasies, Again, like your Black Sands, like your Concrete Comics, like um, your Tuskegee Airs, like the SJS Direct Imprint, we need to put our money into our own productions and invest our black dollars in productions where we are in the forefront, we are the leads, we are the heroes, and we tell our own stories. And when we tell our own stories, we see us in a positive light. And we need to invest in ourselves because if we don't see value in ourselves, no one will ever see our value. And that's one of the things we have to do because when I look at the way Ray Fisher was treated on the set of this show and I hear about the other stories, then we need to just, instead of us begging to be a part of their fantasies, we need to go make a reality where we create our own businesses and we start supporting them and we support our own productions, our own publications, and we become the heroes of our own stories. Now, if you want to pick up some of the action-packed African-American fantasy I present on the SJS Direct Imprint, you can pick up the books of the Isis series, the e Steam series, the John Haynes series, and the books of the Spinsterella Trilogy on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. You can also find them on Smashwords, the iBook Store, and Google Play. And if you want to see me make more videos and be able to pay for more books and book covers, you can donate to my Patreon, my PayPal, or my Cash App by clicking the links in the description box. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe. Now available in paperback and e-readers, E-Steam Blast from the Past. Hell's aspiring angel takes on her demonic doppelganger in this action-packed, time-traveling E-Steam series adventure. Get E-Steam Blast from the Past with a bonus E-Steam comic book, No Good Deed, in paperback and e-readers at online booksellers everywhere.